And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Live Real Press, and the man create the man who is reminding you that there can be only one with the upcoming RPG Lords of Eternity. The one and only Jason, don't call him Mark Wahlberg. Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm pretty that sure the people have made I'm pretty sure I'm not the first to make that joke. That's the man who taught everybody to misspell my name. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I just get I just get reminded of the of the Michael Bolton guy in Office Space. Yes, <laughs> I feel for him. Oh, when I, the last the last time I was the last time I was out in, in Eastern Europe, I I um I had a bunch of people asking if I was related to Mirko Krokop. I'm not. So I can I can relate to that pain, or just or just people assuming that there's a complicated way to go with my to go with my name when there really isn't. I mean it's not, it's not like I'm it's not like I have to deal with the name like Doug Mankiewicz or something. True. <laughs> oh, but I'd like to start at the humble beginnings in a sense. All right. Walk me through your first introduction to tabletop and what and how what made it stick. All right, so tabletop. All right, so we're going back to the nineties. Um, a friend of mine had a dated a girl who was playing D anD D, and sounded like fun. So we got started. I DM'd my first game ever. First game I played, I was the DM. Um, that campaign fell apart after a couple of weeks, but I found another group and I still play with the second group I started playing with. Mm -hmm. Um, so some of us have been gaming together for almost 30 years now. And then I didn't start making anything until last year. Mm -hmm. Um, it's... I love tabletop gaming. I'm generally a creative person. I'm generally a storyteller. It's been a great way to spend time with my kids mm. and stay in contact with the friends I've had for ever. And I can actually trace every single thing in my life that I'm not directly related to, to D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. I met my wife. I was introduced by somebody I met at a gaming table. I moved to the metro area. Because somebody I met at a gaming table got me a job. Mm -hmm. Everything I have right now, I trace back to tabletop gaming. Yeah. And I can I can cer I can certainly get behind the, that. And would it be fair of me to say that you weren't that you weren't really a one system person? You had you had jumped around between a bunch of different games over the years. Oh, I've played lots of games. I probably have a hundred or more role playing games in the room I'm in right now. I've played probably more Cyberpunk 2020 and Vampire than I have D and D. Oh, I can I can get behind I can get behind Cyberpunk 2020, especially since um, there have there have only been th there have only been three editions of Cyberpunk. The Green Book doesn't exist. <laughs> yes. Um, I put the, I put the, I put that up there with st with stuff like every experience I've had with Rifts and L five R second edition of we don't talk about that. Ha. Yes, was not a fan of that book. And as far I I end, I ended up skip I ended up skipping it. I didn't find out about it until years after the damage was done. Um. Then I then I looked at it and the navigation for the book automatically triggered me. 
I'm some I'm somebody who tilts very easily at bad navigation in books. And I've raked people over the coals for not ha for not having proper indexes. <laughs> but I think the there are a few thing there are a few things in Cyberpunk V3 that probably could have worked. It's just that it's just that the whole Cyberpunk concept got pushed a little bit too a little bit too out of left field. Like it's left sort of, field, sort of, different league, different sport. They kind of got rid of the cyberware. It started. It started to veer into the into the kind of thing I would have seen in high concept SF instead of cyberpunk. Yes, absolutely. Oh, I had the misfortune of getting that on pre order from my gaming store. Oof. So. I got it the day it was available, and I've never once had an urge to play it. Oh, I may re I may revisit it for a what for a read through and ri and riff like I've done in the past, but um, I need a sufficient amount of alcohol to do it. Yeah. And right now, my liquor cabinet is not sufficient. Well, life is better without it. <laughs> um. Although when it, when you mention Vampire the Masquerade, I'm tempted to I'm te when you mention Vampire, I'm tempted to say, "Oh, which one?" <laughs> Second, Ed, I haven't played Vampire in twenty years, mm -hmm. almost twenty years. Well, the the main reason I the main reason I say that is I didn't know if you were talking about Masquerade, Dark Ages, or fucking King Kindred of the East. All right, I own almost the entire White Wolf Library from around 1999 and 2000. I have all the major core books. I have every single one of the Vampire Splat books and a bunch of the Werewolf Splat books. Um, I have all of the lines. I have Changeling. I have Wraith. I have Werewolf, Mage, all of them. But it's right around that time frame that, that I played White Wolf, White Wolf when it was still White Wolf. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm cur I'm curious if I'd have to double check if around that time what was around when a when Aeon had come out. I know it's I know it's technically called Trinity, but that's not the title that's on the book that I have. I don't know because um because I I have all three I have all three core books from the tr from the Trinity experiment that White Wolf did and. The first one was supposed to be called Aeon, but MTV got pissy, so they went with Trinity. At least that's the story that, I, that I've been told. I don't know if it was actually MTV getting pissy over the over potential association with Aeon Flux, which is honestly kind of weak. Yep, yeah, I don't know that I've ever looked at a Trinity book. I think that's one that just managed to glide completely under my radar. Yeah. And it's it was an interesting experiment. It was from what I understand it was mainly to see if they if they could branch out of what they had been doing. But that be that being that being said, um, given the concept with Lords of Eternity, how much of how much of a Highlander fan were were you growing up? I was a pretty decent Highlander fan mm -hmm. um, for the first couple of movies. What? No love for the TV show. I also do love the TV show. Um, I'm rewatching that TV show again. Um, um, well, except the, for the Raven, we don't talk about the Raven. <laughs> no. Although the later movies just got weird or terrible or both. Yeah, I think the only every every movie after every movie after the first one was either bafflingly weird or bad, with the exception of Search for Vengeance. Probably, beca probably because of the fact that you had 
you had it. You had an anime studio who who was just given the who was just given the base cliff notes and said, "Just go nut, just go nuts with the idea, without having to worry about continuity." See, I liked the second movie. It didn't really feel like Highlander, but I enjoyed the second movie. That said, that's not a movie I've had any interest in rewatching for decades. But He Man, I'm rewatching that series again too. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when it comes, to, although when it comes to He Man, when it comes to He Man, I'm guess I'm guessing you you've primarily focused on the filmation run and avoided the movie. Okay, the movie doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man. Um, I did. I have enjoyed three of the four TV series. Though. Is one of the is one of them the that the attempt that was done in the two thousands? Okay, so the attempt that was done in the two thousands. My oldest kid was born in ninety nine. Mm-hmm. He was three when two when that came out. I'd pick him up from daycare, we'd come home, and we would watch that show. Every every episode that came out, as it came out, I loved the early 2000s remake series. It was just such a bonding time with my kid. Mm-hmm. I, the only... I, fi- I find that it, did, it didn't get a whole lot of love at the, t- at the time, but in recent years it's gotten something of a reevaluation. Maybe because we've had to put up with worse things. Hi, Kevin Smith. How you doing? See, now that's another one that I enjoyed. I didn't like the the latest. They released two anime series or two He Man series this year. I didn't like the anime feeling one. Didn't care for that. The Kevin Smith one, I enjoyed it. Once the second half came out, mm. I'll ag- I'll agree to disagree on that. I did I didn't ca- I didn't care for it and I'm pre- I'm pretty sure if I'm pretty sure just the thought of that is making Kevin Smith cry but <laughs> that uh, that's not narrowing it down much. I understand a lot of the reasons people didn't like it and I I get it. I just enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I don't put a really high standard on the media I consume. I don't demand that it be true to what I grew up with. I don't I just try to suspend disbelief and go with what the people who make things are putting out. Yeah. And um, that worked for me. Um that be that being that being said, um walk me through just the just the foundation the chain of events that led to the creation of Lords of Eternity and what made you go with um illuminated by Lumen. All right, so He-Man's been a huge part of my life, basically since I was little. Um, I was four or five when it when the original series came out. I had a bunch of the toys. I even cut up coloring books to make characters when the, I didn't have enough of the toys. I had a suitcase full of cut up coloring books that I just lay out on the dining room table and have all my different characters there. And then we already talked about my kid and He-Man. So mm-hmm. He-Man's been a part of my life forever. And then Highlander, I enjoyed that. I grew up with that too. And then one day I was watching, I actually switched from He-Man to Highlander, or actually the other way around. I was watching Highlander. My kid wanted to watch He-Man. This is not the first kid we talked about. So we switched and I'm just that juxtaposition while I'm watching them both back to back made me think it needed to be a game. And then I started looking for systems, and I was going for a total over-the-top power fantasy, which is kind of a selling point of Lumen. Lumen is intended to be an over-the-top power fantasy with no thought to balance at all. Mm -hmm. And it just worked. And the game's ridiculously fun to play. And... Go ahead. What And, um... One thing I'm curious is is if there if um if Lumen was your first pick or if there were some potential picks that for the system that you had con- that you'd considered early on, but with uh, but with time did, did um just didn't work out. So 
I end up with a notebook full of game ideas, different scraps of stuff. And this one, I had the idea and then I was reading Lumen and it just kind of clicked. There was never a lot of other consideration. I have, I mean, I have pretty much all the SRDs out there. I have all the systems. And this is just the one that that clicked. There were, really wasn't any consideration after that. Mm-hmm. I read I read the Lumen system. I read the SRD. I had this other idea, and they just fit so well together that I didn't think about anything else. Yeah. Now, something I've I've had some debates regarding regarding the nature of power fantasy, especially the more over the top ends. And there's but there's been a there's been arguments on both sides of this about whether or not making characters that level of powerful eliminates threat. And when you have characters of a, of a sufficient of a, of that over the top levels of power, um, in your mind, how do you make, how do you maintain the level of threat to the point where, um, get where gameplay doesn't feel too easy? Okay. So, the basic premise of Lords of Eternity is that you've got these superhero, super-powered heroes, mm-hmm. or villains, and they're all, there's a hundred of them, and they're all slowly fighting each other, stealing each other's power until there's just one left. Every session that we play, they are running up against other super-powered people who are killing people to get their power. Mm-hmm. So, it's escalating, the villains are always escalating too. So the threat grows, um, and then the actions the players do can kill themselves pretty easily, too. Um, We've got one, we don't have them anymore, but we had a tinker a couple of sessions ago who managed to rig together nine different blaster pistols and wipe out an entire room full of people, and then Critical failed and blew himself up. He didn't quite die from that, but it made it really easy for the villain to take his head. And then everybody else had to deal with a slightly more powerful villain for the fight. And so, oh, go ahead. So, uh, I guess everything I'm doing, they're fighting other people like them who are also growing in power as the game progresses. Yeah. So there's never, they aren't really fighting normal pe- normal villains. They're fighting other superheroes. Mm-hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, Given the given the um, archetype based design that Lumen has, I I do see that you have some that you have something similar in the form of the Trinity of Warrior, Tinker, and Mage. Um, how do you how do you make sure that they're that those three are distinct from one another? A lot of that gets into the special abilities like a tinker can make anything mm-hmm. given time and the time is in between sessions a tinker can pretty much make anything and they have a jury rig ability so i just mentioned the tinker who rigged together nine blasters and was able to wipe up an entire room full of people um the uh, the mage can pretty much carve reality into anything they want mm-hmm. and then the fighters just really good at fighting and they also have different levels of power that they can access. So everything's powered by magic. I call it power in the game, which gets a little bit confusing sometimes. Mm-hmm. So a uh, mage has the highest power pool. The fighter has the lowest power pool. And then the health is reversed. The fighter has the most health and the mage has the least. And a tinker for health and power is just a happy medium in between those. Mm-hmm. And in gameplay, they feel very different. Yeah, and I'd I'd also seen in the sheet um, setup that you you have essentially three um, primary attributes: might, right, and focus. Yes. Now, what what would what would differentiate those three? As in, what right, would you so, what would you use each one of them for? So a core part of Lumen is that you don't have skills. Mm-hmm. You have your approach to doing things. In this case, we've got might, right, and focus. So might is mighty. 
you're taking the mighty swing with your sword in a debate you're yelling and screaming and not reason debate mm -hmm. um right on the other hand is doing the right thing in the right way at the right time so that would be stabbing someone cutting someone's achilles tendon as you run past or making the right persuasive argument and focus comes into the things that really take your attention like a sniper rifle or careful carefully programming a hack for a computer system but any one of those abilities can be used to do pretty much anything it it just affects your approach mm -hmm. so if somebody was using might to hack a computer that would be like brute forcing a password mm -hmm. as opposed to calling someone up and socially engineering a password out of somebody yeah now when it comes to ma when it comes to magic, plenty of games ha have ha have had their difficulties with trying to with trying to do a magic system, or in, or in the worst cases, inc including some offenders you're probably familiar with, um, have the casters get more game out of the game. So with the with the whole setup with casting magic, how do you ha how do you handle it? All right. So first, we restrict the casters a little bit. If they're trying to do use magic to do something that is one of the core special abilities in the game, then they're doing it a little bit weaker. So you can't just take be a caster and get all of the actual abilities that all the super powered abilities. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to be really fast, there's a speed ability. It's going the the cast speed is going to be slower than actually having the speed ability. Mm. So they don't get to do everything. Other than that, magic is very, very free form. Um, I try to balance out the magic by tacking it to the power level. If somebody has three levels in cast magic, then when they do an attack, that's three harm they're doing. Mm -hmm. So that's, but it's so free form. There, everything on there is very improv heavy and i've got some very improv heavy players in the campaign i'm playing mm -hmm. so magic gets used very creatively mm -hmm. now within the within that it could be it could be argued that power is both is both your primary resource as well as as well as your extra effort because just looking at the sheets one of the key things that you can do with power is a do-over on an attribute roll. Yes. Oh. Power is very much a core resource. Mm -hmm. Now, just cur just curious, but in your ca in your campaigns, because of the whole, there can be only one kind of thing. Has it has it devolved into PvP between players at any point? It hasn't yet. We are about four sessions into the campaign. Um, everybody knows that the final session is going to be almost entirely PvP. That's that's coming. But I stress when we're starting the game, when I'm introducing the game, I don't really do session zero, but my players, we're friends. We've known each other for a long time. But when I pitch the game, I tell them that this is such a violent, mayhem-filled world that if they don't band together in factions... They're going to end up getting wiped out. They need to work together to survive long enough to kill each other, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And it seems to work out well. Everybody knows it's coming, but nobody's fighting each other yet. Mm -hmm. Now, that brings me to your ver to your version of the quickening. In this case, um, power transfer, because it obviously it can't be enough to just say that they're trying to kill each other to to get the prize. There has to be some sort of effect. Some sort of effect when ta when taking out a lord. Yes. So, if one of the lords of eternity kills another lord of eternity with a bladed weapon, they're presumed to take their head. Mm -hmm. There isn't a specific mechanic for that. If you hit somebody with a sword and they die, you've got their head. Unless you don't want it, and then you just have to say, "I don't kill them" or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but once that happens there's a table you roll on to get that power. And you might gain a point in the Dead Lord's highest attribute. You might gain a new one-point ability or a, a point to your health pool 
or a point to your power pool, or you might gain a point in one of your current abilities. And one of our players has used that to jack his speed up to godlike levels. Mm -hmm. He just keeps rolling really well, and his current abilities keep getting better. What, so, what prompted what prompted you the idea of um of have of having power transfer be re be resolved with a d six? Everything in this game is a d six. Um, what I've been doing game design, I've been moving away from all of the polyhedrals and just sticking to d sixes. Well, what I mean by that is the idea of it of the benefit of power transfer being randomized. It seemed like a good idea at the time. I don't have a solid answer for that. It just, it really did just seem like a good idea at the time. No, it works and, for me. And this way, nobody's really sure of what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants the current ability, but there's no, there's really no negative to any of the power transfers. Yeah. Now, with that in with that in mind, the other thing that I, I found interesting on the on the sheet is the faction sheet. And factions have certainly been present, but I don't think... Well, they've been present in plenty of games, but a lot of times it's something that's glossed over, whereas, there's, whereas there seems to be a, um, a set of mechanics tied to it, at least, in, at least from what I'm seeing. So factions always give you resources. Mm -hmm. So if you're a part of a faction, you can call them for backup or they'll have tinkers that you can use to get better gear or fix your gear if it gets broken. And then they do have some rules. And really the factions are a way for me as a GM to get my people together, to get all the players together and not have to worry about, I really, really hate the, okay, you're in a bar or spending three sessions trying to get every, all the party together to play with each other. I've never spent three sessions, but this way, everybody has something linking them together. And that's something I do in, the, in a lot of the games I make. There's some relationship right from the beginning. And there's I don't have a requirement that all the players play in the same faction, but I strongly recommend it. Mm -hmm. Now... When it comes to when it comes to the faction, when it comes to the factions, um, what can you tell me about the ta about the tags formal, strict, and size? Okay, so a formal faction would have a lot of rules, a lot of hierarchy, and a lot of formality. Mm -hmm. So we have the leader of the faction. So the Sisters of Sorcery is uh, the most formal faction I, I included in the book. Mm -hmm. So the sorceress, not or the not sorceress, because there's no he-man intellectual property here. Legally so distinct. The, yes. Um, the sorceress runs it. She is totally in charge, and she has her lieutenants, and then they have... Everybody has a lot of rules and a lot of things that they have to... that they have to do. And if they get, if they get called up for duty, they have to say yes. Mm -hmm. Um... And then strict is how strict are the rules enforced. And in this case, the Sisters of Sorcery has a very formal hierarchy and a lot of ritual. But they don't really strictly enforce the rules as long as everybody's doing what's best for the planet and the power. And then for the size, that is such a very vague term. Um, Sisters of Sorcery is small. Um, the other fact, One of the other factions I have, Randor's Renegades, they're a big one. But... Size doesn't necessarily mean a lot when you're talking about 100 immortals total. So the size also includes their support staff. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons Randor's Renegades is so big is because they're a part of the planetary military, so they can call on the resources of the army. Mm -hmm. Now, how now with are those are those three are those three merely to? Um, be a representative of the of the overall strength of that of that faction, or what you mentioned resources. So I'm curious how that plays into things. Well, the resources are going to be. I'm going on a mission. I need some weapons. Can my faction supply those? Mm -hmm. 
or I need some backup, or I need someplace safe to heal. So you have all of those resources you can deal with. And then I lost the rest of your question. <laughs> uh, it was mainly about it's mainly about um, resources since you mentioned that. So, and it sounds like you an answered what I was looking for. Um, now that that being said, Highlander had the rule for the longest time of we must never we never fight on holy ground. Um, gift. Now I'm not saying I'm not saying that there is an exact equivalent, but there are cert. But are there certain are there certain rules that lords have that lords have to follow even when it comes to fighting other lords? There isn't. I didn't put any of that in there. <laughs> Honestly, the only thing I really took from Highlander was taking someone's power by cutting off their head, mm -hmm. and then the final prize. Yeah. Uh, and I I can I can certainly see that because. It's ne it's it was it was hinted at the consequences in the TV show, but f up until Search for Vengeance, they never they never really went into what exactly is going to happen to you um, if you draw your sword on holy ground. And in that particular case, it was getting struck by lightning. <laughs> yeah, I didn't touch anything religious in this game in any way, mm -hmm. and I just. Skipped over that. It didn't seem to add anything terribly of value to this, mm -hmm. so I didn't do it. Just cer is certainly fair. Now, one of the other things I was curious about is the concept of corruption, and how the and how that would work within the system. Okay, so with corruption, if you die, mm -hmm. and you can use your power to heal yourself instantly. But if you die, then the if you still have power, the power automatically wakes you back up. Heals you completely, you're wide awake, but one power point of your power gets corrupted. And then you can also corrupt your power to temporarily boost one of your abilities. So if you have a speed of four and you want a speed of five, you can corrupt a point of power, and your speed becomes... Or your, I don't remember if I said speed or strength, but whichever. Speed. It becomes five, and you're godlike. Mm -hmm. Beyond godlike. Four is already godlike. And then, when you're rolling, when you have corrupted powers, you also get benefits to your abilities. So, there's pluses and minuses to corrupting your power. There's always a benefit, and there's always a negative. And the biggest negative is you can't use that point of power for the things that power would normally be for, like healing, or casting magic, or powering one of your abilities. Would you say it's a case of high risk, high reward? It's all, it's a case of desperation, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't had anybody deliberately corrupt power yet. I'm sure it's going to happen. It's probably going to happen in my next session when we fight Godzilla. Um, Wait, what? <laughs> um, I, so I have a campaign setting for this that I'm releasing serially also. And it's a stretch goal in the Kickstarter. But about once a month, I release a new chapter to a campaign and then additions to the campaign setting. So the campaign I'm playing, I'm also releasing. Mm -hmm. And the next chapter that my players haven't seen yet, it's Godzilla with a ridiculous amount of power and a ridiculous amount of health and all of the Godzilla abilities. Yep. And... Th that's in that kind of approach, and I'm get I'm guessing Noturnus Knights is the name of that campaign. Um, it is. That's an interesting approach, if o if only because it kind of reminds me of the replays that I that I kept hearing about when it came to Japanese tabletop games back in the day. Um, what prompted what prompted doing this chapter ba this chapter based approach? Um, that was mostly based on my lack of focus in getting it all done at once. So, made the game, released the game on itch, and started a campaign. And then a couple of people wanted more than just the game. Mm -hmm. So, I started releasing it. But I didn't have everything yet. I still don't have the entire campaign planned. 
got the broad strokes, not the details. So it's been released as I do it. And I was just really upfront about this is what's happening with Noturnus Knights. Yeah. And with the, with that in mind, how t I'm guessing that beca because of how light something like Lumen is, um, Lords of Eternity is not necessarily tied to one particular setting. Not in any specific way, no. As long as it's some high magic, high, high sci-fi, fantasy world, mm -hmm. everything else fits. Yeah. But Noturnus Knights names the planet Noturnus. Mm -hmm. There's, I have a map, and there's cities, and setting, and more NPCs, and a history. So with Noturnus Knights, you actually learn about how the Immortals came to be, and what effect that has on history. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in mind, what are you shooting for? I realize that asking for the page count for, for an Eternus Knights is, is um, kind of redundant, but what are you shooting for as far as the total page count for Lords of Eternity? So, Lords of Eternity is... The digital version's done. Mm -hmm. The Kickstarter's all about getting a print run done. So that's... I think it's 40 or 45 pages. Mm -hmm. um, no, Eternus Knights is going to be 12 to 15 chapters. And each chapter in the in the campaign comes out to between three and five pages. Mm -hmm. I'm a pretty improv heavy DM, and that really does come through in the campaign I do, in the way I release modules like that. So I have five to seven scenes. I have the major villains, the immortals you're going to be fighting. I have their minions, and I have a summary, maybe a map if it's relevant, and that's what is a chapter for me. Mm -hmm. So it's not a fully featured Wizards of the Coast module. You're going to have to be able to handle some stuff yourself. But all the all the broad strokes are there. All the high points are there, along with the details you need when you're actually going into doing the fighting and the plot. Mm -hmm. But I don't fill in every possible detail. And then the campaign setting, I'm going to guess the campaign setting itself, just the Noturnus details are probably going to come out to be another 20 or 30 pages by the time it's done. All right. So we're looking at 100 pages across the board for everything. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how that develops. And I do and I do wish the best of luck in um in well for your for your players tackling tackling on Godzilla. Um <laughs> I'm almost curious which version you're having them go against. Um, recent one. Ah, uh, legendary. I think so. Yes. There's healing. He's super fast. He's got atomic breath. He's 550 feet tall. Oh, resurgent. No, I I take it back. Resurgence is the most recent one. I would have to look at which one I actually look at. I'm on. I've got the Godzilla fandom.com wiki mm -hmm. up. Oh, I'm looking at MonsterVerse. Yeah, that, yeah, that would be le that would be legendary then. Oh. I I from the from the film that liked to tease me th at least three times. <laughs> <laughs> but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto my show and enjoy the madness at play here. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>